I told my husband yesterday, I said, I think the universe brought you into my life to teach me patience, not because he's so frustrating, but because I love him so much. I find myself being so much more patient than I've ever been in my life. And it's not that he is a person who makes me, who makes, you know what I'm saying? It's not because he is so, oh, I have to be patient. It's that I just find myself wanting to be. Does that kind of make sense? Him in my life makes me practice patience because I really, for all the people in the universe, I want to be patient for, it's him. You know, I'm not always the patient for my mother. I'm not always patient for my siblings. I'm definitely not patient for my friends. And I'm like, nope, I don't want to be patient for you today. But because of who his place in my life, because I love him more than I love the universe, I want to be the most patient person I can. And patience it is always something I've had to work on. I will have to work on it for the rest of my life. I'm not a patient person with most people, but for somebody that I love more than the universe, like who else am I supposed to be patient for? What the heck is love? Love. 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 You know, mm. never knew what I was missing. Love, am I right? But I knew once we start kissing, I to hear how that sounds in the editing booth. <laughs> but for real, what is this thing? Is it a feeling? Is it an attachment? Is it an obsession? Yes. Is it an infection? Ooh. Is it a life altering drug that changes us for the better? Are certain kinds of love more noble than others? Love of God, love of country, love of your fellow person? Or is it one big confusing construct used to distract us from the inevitable? Death. Distract us from thinking about death and the fact that we're all dying. As you can tell, this subject makes me a little kooky, you know? Makes me a little, little, little. P.S. Next month, I'm hosting a panel on unconditional love inspired by Smith's recent panel because I do believe in unconditional love and I believe I've discovered what it is in my own terms. So let's see if Khadija talks about it in their video. But I really do believe in unconditional love versus what I call momentary love because I think love can be a moment and then I think love can be unconditional. And I think those two things are often confused with one another. And it seems like it does the same for y'all. I have been thinking about love my entire life, but the last few years, it's been right at the forefront of my mind because I realized at some point in my late 20s, I did not know how to describe or define love. I didn't understand what it meant when I said it. I thought I did, I had an idea of it, but it was really vague, really hazy, really uh, unfocused. And mm. because of that, I didn't always have a clear intention when it came to love, not just for loving others on any kind of platonic, romantic, familial sense, but also for myself. At my big age of 31, after my Saturn return finally freed me, <laughs> God, the last few years have been so hard. I know for everybody. I know, I know, I know. I'm just, <sighs> but I'm feeling like I finally have a much better sense of love, y'all. And today we're gonna break it down. Oh, we are in our philosophy bag today. We talking love, how it's depicted in the media and why it's so confusing as a result, how vague the concept is and how we don't have a solid definition. If my little tiny community post was anything to go off of. I'm working on a video about love, mainly about how a lot of us don't seem to know what it is and how that can be a hindrance to all aspects of our life, socially, emotionally, and politically. Yes, I know what love is, duh, 41%. No, oh my gosh, finally someone said it, 59%. At least in this community, we don't have a solid definition. What happens when we don't have a definition and understanding a clear vision of love? And how can we get that vision? I'll share my definition and y'all can let me know if you vibe with it or not. And this is... Mm. I don't know. It's going to be fun. I love talking about love. I'm so excited. Please watch. Girl, you're blowing out my ears. The video. Oh, this is going to be so embarrassing. I'm going to be watching it. Ah. Okay, it's fine. So without further ado, bonjour, nakam, hi. My name is Khadija. If this is the first time seeing your, seeing your face. This is the first time seeing your face. Oh my God, did you just wake up? Oh my God. Uh, if this is your first time seeing my face, I just sit in my living room and, and ask questions and try to answer them and unpack them. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So if you wanna check it out, suss out the vibe, let me know. Nieces, nephews, nibblings, aunties, uncles, piblings, 
How y'all doing? How was your week? The holidays are coming up. How are you? This is the longest intro in the world. Let's go, girl. I want to know what love is. Feeling. Mm, mm, mm. Holi- mm, girl, I know. I know. What's a holiday when, you know? Oh, gestures at the world. I was like, what is this? I couldn't read this. Hope y'all are okay. And uh, I hope this video brings to you some insight, some clarity. And if nothing else, just some good conversation have with yourself and with the people in your life. No, 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 no. Momo says her intro, or it's their intro. Um, annoyed the fuck out of me. It's a me problem, I know. It's actually a sensory problem. It's really bad. It's giving me a headache, but it's not Khadija's fault. It's my brain's fault. But I'm like, my, the high pitched noises make me want to like claw out my own brains. Um, not very friendly to the autists. Not that I'm autistic, but it's not very friendly to like the sensory sensitive people. If you would like to support this channel financially, I know the economy is ashy, so grain of salt, I just got to say it to put the bug in people's ear. You can join my Patreon and slash or you can get some merch. We're doing a sale this week for Let's Flaunt. Uh, yeah, just some tote bags and pins if you like. All right, let's get into it. Love never. seems like a lot of us are confused about love and it's hard not to be. If I think about the media as the first example of what informs our information about love and can lead to that confusion, I see a sanitized, commodified tool masquerading as love. Think about the rom-coms you might have grown Already, already. See how we refer to the world to tell us what love is? What do you feel like love is, right? Like, what do you feel like love is, right? Growing up with, if you're around my age or older. Yep, a yep, sanitized yep, yep, classics. sanitized version of love where the main point is that love is messy and confusing. Mm. See, even though I grew up with knowing that, I also knew it wasn't the right answer. So I never watched rom-coms thinking that's what love was. Because it never made sense they were together. Like, if you watch 37 dresses, 27 dresses, like, obviously, they're not even compatible. Like, in a lot of these love story romances, like, no one's even compatible. That's why anime has the best love stories, right? Everybody knows anime has the best love stories. Um, and I actually think anime has a much better, healthier representation of love and relationships than, like, rom-coms or media will ever have, like, Hollywood media. But I knew it wasn't what love was because I had my parents as a living example of love. I also had love for my siblings. I think when you grow up like really loving your siblings, like loving the consciousness that they are, like you learn what love is. Like I know what love is because I, I have a family that I love. Like I know what it is to love my cat Indiana Jones versus another cat that I see that I love as an animal because I'm like, oh, I love all human beings. But I don't love all human beings the way I love my animal. Like, I love Indiana more than I love strangers I don't know, right? Because, like, I don't know them. But I love them all in general. In the same way that I love all cats, but I don't love all cats the way I love Indiana. And it's not about more or less. It's about the differences of love. So I'm really lucky that I grew up with a family that I loved. Like, I really love my family. And I think every single one of them is very important to me. And I will know them until the day I die. I couldn't imagine not knowing them. And it hurts when we don't always get along, right? Because like that's painful, but that's also a part of loving someone unconditionally is that you you wait for them, you know? That's kind of a part of it. And can be a bit toxic, but it perseveres no matter what. No matter if you met in chemistry class and I was secretly plotting this whole time to destroy your brother's reputation with three of his exes, but after I embarrassed him in front of everyone, he discovered that he was a polyamorous king and you and I decided that we could finally be together. I love John Tucker Must Die. Oh, it's such a good movie. <laughs> but love in the media in terms of film and television was always a tumultuous, will they, won't they? 
they finally did and it's a disaster or on again off again uh-huh. constantly toxic sex in the city big and carry one of the most toxic 10-year relationships that we've ever seen displayed on television i love sex in the city but carrie and big had very unhealthy attachment styles with one another and obviously that's like that's isn't that isn't what i think of as love but i think that they were sort of like each other's toxic soulmates if you will but they were never really like healthy soulmates they could have been maybe if they got healthy but i mean not a great example of a functioning relationship like dynamics but we love each other and we just can't help it love looked like an addiction Mm -hmm. and almost like a disease which is what worries me when people are like are you gonna get bored in your relationship because it's so healthy and i'm like Did you hear yourself ask that question out loud? Did you hear yourself ask that question out loud? Do you think I'm going to get bored in my relationship because it's so healthy? Do you want to ask yourself that question again, ma'am? You can't get rid of once you've been infected by it, but it's a disease you want to get. In songs, we hear the same thing. I was listening to a bunch of love playlists and music for this video and just the same themes of people singing about love being this obsession for them. This person. Mm, Samir says in the night in the 90s, you were a loser if you watched anime. Didn't know a single girl in real life who watches anime or don't know a single girl. You don't know anyone who watches Sailor Moon. You don't know anyone who watches any of like Fruits Basket or none of it. I When I was growing up, not very many people watched anime, but anyone who watched Cartoon Network watched anime. And like my siblings and I watched anime, but our friends didn't. But everyone knew what Dragon Ball Z was growing up and everyone knew what Sailor Moon was growing up and everyone watched Pokemon. You don't know anyone who watched Pokemon growing up? That feels weird. Like maybe I was just like in the bubble I was in. But yeah, like I went to the movie theater and everybody was there to watch Pokemon. So like people watch anime, but whether or not they're like attached to anime to a certain extent is different. Um, But it definitely was niche until recently. I think it only became mainstream now, I would say. And then even though it's mainstream, not everybody watches anime. Like some people watch anime. My partner watches anime. I, in in general, watch. I feel like I don't watch enough anime because like other people watch so much. But like I watch anime, right? Like it's like a daily occurrence. Like basically that we watch anime in the house. But it also was growing up. My parents love Ghibli films. They let us watch Dragon Ball Z and Sailor Moon and Naruto and um Tenchi and uh, I don't know like uh, everything that was basically on television we watched so also the family you grew up in but anime was also more interesting to my parents because it's kind of philosophy based and they they like it better than like American cartoons you know what I mean because American cartoons aren't that they're not as like thoughtful I think as anime so and being their one and only love being forever all of these sanitized depictions of the beauty of love, the sacrifice that comes with it. And no matter what, even if it doesn't seem great or it has its problems, the ends justify the means. Mm -hmm. Love is commodified in our world too, because I mean, well, Valentine's Day is one of the biggest examples of that, but it's also- Do you know on Valentine's Day, my parents go to church because it's about St. Valentine and they don't like the way it's been commodified. But my parents aren't also aren't like gift givers in that way, but they don't celebrate Valentine's Day. They never have. They've always gone to church because it's about St. Valentine. So also like your home dictates your relationship with love, not just media. But if your parents don't raise you and they expect to be raised by media, then yes. And if your parents fall for media, which is fine, and they buy into Valentine's Day, which is fine. I'm not going to moralize Valentine's Day, but they're saying this is the example, right? Like buy a ring, buy, buy, consume because I grew up with religious parents, like consumerism is like pretty anti Jesus, you know, basically, basically, if you become like even on Black Friday, like my parents absolutely did not shop, right? So the relationship you're having is going to be dictated by how we were raised, I think much more than the media. Also, just the way our culture treats spending money as Mm -hmm. a gesture of love. And if you don't believe me, let's let's play this thought exercise. You've been seeing someone for a few months. You want to be exclusive with them, be a partner. It's a romantic sort of vibe. And all you ever do is hang out at one of your apartments and watch TV and chill. Maybe once in a while you go to the park or Mm -hmm. you go for walks, but that's it. Now, to me, those are my ideal kind of dates. But some people might hear that and go, we never go out. We, mm, I don't, I don't think so. 
what are you ashamed of me? What are you hiding me? What you don't care about me? What's going on here? Well, in different bubbles, different things mean different things. So in some places, like that could mean they're hiding you. And in other places, it means they love you enough to chill. So many public spaces are catered to couples and families in mind. Couples and families spending money in mind. So many industries pop up because of couples. Now it's become less weird, but before if you went out by yourself and you read a book at a bar, people would be like, what are you doing here, you single freak? Get the f I've been doing that since I was like 21. So I've been doing that for like 15 years by myself. Like what am I, 34? So like I've been doing that since I like, not even 21, that's too old. I've been doing it since I could drive, 18. I've been taking myself out. Because again, like, I'm just like, I'm good with that. But, I, you know, I think people honestly admired me for it. That's the t that's the story I'm telling my delusional self. Because people would always be like, are you waiting for someone? I'm like, nah, girl, I'm taking myself out. And they'd be like, oh. And I think some people secretly, like, want to do that, but they don't. And I just, like, don't care about social expectations in that way. Like, I'm not going to miss out on food because there's no one to go with, girl. I like to eat. I told my partner the other day, I was like, we have to do my 10 steps a day or 20, 10K steps a day. I want to eat anything I want to eat. And he's like, I like that you work out just to eat. I was like, that's the only thing I care about, okay? Bars are too loud to read at. There were some cozy ass bars in Seattle, though. Some bars in Seattle were like a vibe. And so like I could see it, but I would, I agree. I think I'd want a more chill place to read than a bar but I could imagine like a cool bar like a library bar is that just like a nerd dream and that would be a vibe the fuck out of here this is for people who love and spend money bitch I bitch. spend money too just by myself I also think about again if you're my age how Instagram was mm. so couples goals relationship central for a good period it still probably is like that to an extent but even more so in the 2010s everybody needed to let each other know who they were in a relationship with and so many of these people mm. ended up and still do have things like family channels couples channels where people just want to know more about their relationship and their love I even think about as a recent example, people that meet on reality TV shows and fall in love and then their whole brand, even if their love is real, even if they are married, get together, have a family, whatever, but there's an aspect of their love that is commodified. This isn't even a judgment really. This is, these are observations. Think about how expensive weddings are. The average wedding costing $30,000. Girl, ain't nobody got time for that. Mm -mm. Girl. Now my sister, I think she spent like 10, my brother, I wonder how much my farm brother spent on his wedding actually. Hmm. I spent very little, like 3K maybe. I don't even know. Um, what did my brother spend on his wedding actually? I would like to know that. Hola, that's gonna put a dent in my student loan debt. So if anybody wants to donate thirty thousand dollars, if you, if if you would want to give me a wedding gift, knowing that same, if you want to give me a wedding gift, <laughs> and I'm never gonna get married, I'll send you the wire transfer info. Okay. Where are the sugar daddies or mommies? Where are the sugar? They're parents? online, girl. You know you could get it if you wanted it. Two figures. <laughs> Another reason I think love can be confusing for a lot of us is because love is used as a tool to put people into boxes, to organize people in society. And in this case, I mean into hierarchies of importance and reifying traditional values. When I look at conservatives and folks that fall more to the right, their view of love and how it doesn't seem like they can even conceive of the fact that queer people can experience love, that queer love can exist or function or anything because to them the only type of love that is real that is legitimate is the love of firstly god or the father and the love of a man and a woman because their love creates more people if your love isn't creating more humans to work under capitalism then it's not love girl it's demonic it's anti-religious it's anti-human it's groomer behavior and it's not allowed here said the people who are they talking about like, are they, are they trying to make an argument? Yes. I think that's true. Like if you're literally only making children to like make the economy move forward, I think you're crazy. If you're making children for like Jesus or like your God or like that's what you're supposed to be doing, that's beautiful, but crazy. But like if you're literally only having children to make society move forward, I do think you're kind of crazy, but also like you're just moving within your biology. Like you're literally such an animal that your brain is just like make babies make babies make babies 
like you know what I mean but that's what you're doing you're like producing children to like be worker bees in society and I think that's crazy but I think people paint it as if they're being the heroes of society by keeping society going but again like why does it have to keep going like what's your obligation to keep it going you know what I mean it's one thing to say you need souls for Christ or souls for Allah or souls for like whatever but it's one thing to say like society, like I need to make society keep going when all y'all Bibles talk about the end of the world constantly. So even even your God doesn't want the world to keep going. It's supposed to end eventually. Who No love. Mm. God. Under this kind of thinking, the family is tied to the morality of love. And for some of us, it can take a long time to rid ourselves not only of the shame of feeling delegitimized in our love because it doesn't look like the normative standard, but... I saw this TikTok. I saved it for you guys. A what phase are you guys at in your marriage right now? We very recently. What phase are you guys at in your marriage right now? We very recently like kind of finalized the decision that we're not going to have kids. Um, it's something that. Thank yeah. you. Congratulations. <laughs> You're the first person to say that. Um, yeah. I mean, so Shan has two kids with Jared, and that's the host of the podcast. And this guest um, just said, "You're the first person to say that." It's a, a decision that we've been thinking about for like over a decade now, and kind of like kept kicking the can down the road. Like, we'll keep talking about it. Um, but Xander just got a vasectomy last month. That desire for kids never really emerged. I know if, if we were to have a kid today, I know I would love it. I know I'd be a great parent. It's not about that. But like just being able to look at my kid and say like, your mom wanted you so bad. Like, I wanted you so badly. And I just, I never felt like I could get to that point. Yeah, but it's re it's really hard to separate like the want from the shoulds, yes. you know. Like, Amen. and oh, yeah. I, you know, I think that was that was the journey for so long. It was you know once we started, at least just considering the possibility of oh well, what if we didn't? Then you hear that other voice, all the shoulds, and you know the family and society and friends, and yeah, I mean like, we still hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I think for me, it's just been it's been a really positive practice and kind of killing off the people pleaser in me and like yeah like why why would I make a huge life-altering decision like that for somebody who isn't me and somebody who isn't my wife what phase are you guys at in your somebody who isn't me and somebody who isn't my wife because we usually play into the bubbles right the bubble dictates how we're supposed to see ourselves and it makes us feel shame because we're not performing accordingly, which I think is valid. And I think it's important that some people do want that. Like some people do want to do what's according to the bubble. And I think that's fine. Um, so I think that's reasonable for people who vibe that way. I think it's really bad when we moralize it. When we moralize people not having kids or having kids, look, like, have kids if you want to have kids. Don't have kids if you don't have kids. I just want it to be healthy. I want you to not have kids for the healthy reason. I want you to have kids for the healthy reason. And I think for me, it's about saying that we want to avoid unhealthy. And then that is dictated based off of, like, why we're having it in the first place, right? So I think there's a conversation to be had about those, though, like, that way instead of the moralizing, like, you have to repopulate the planet and like you have an obligation in this way and you have to do it. Ma'am, I don't have time for this. Of also legitimizing it for ourselves, validating ourselves in our own kind of love. Now, those are just a few of the reasons that I have observed what- And since Khadija's talking about love, like so many people will talk about the love of a child, how it changes you. And I think that is true for some people and not for others, right? Like horrible people are also parents. And I think more than that, like sometimes really good parents can be very bad parents and like the nuance of that is very complicated. And then on top of that, I do think that for somebody like me, I would love that child no matter what. But I also um, like still want to be very strategic about whether or not I'm bringing that child into the world. So depending on the category you fall into, depending on your type of person, I think it's more than reasonable not to have kids as it is to have kids, you know? What makes love and defining it so confusing for all of us. Even if it's still confusing, all of those different things work together to create all kinds of expectations. And the expectations don't always match up.
So even though I've said that love seems to be very confusing for most of us, we still have expectations about love and how we want to be loved, even if we can't quite define it. A lot of those expectations from y'all's comments and feedback look like love being patient, love being kind and caring, love being a priority, love being different, whether it's romantic or familial or platonic, love being a sacrifice, love being forever. Probably the most common comment was love just being a feeling that you couldn't quite articulate. And I used to think love was all of those things too. But when I was holding those things up to the light under a bit more scrutiny, prodding a bit more over the last few years, it seemed like those descriptions of love didn't factor in the contradictory and ever-changing nature of human beings. Sorry! Uh, I think, I don't know what, okay, Khadija needs to stop yelling into the microphone. It is blowing out the sound, which I'm sure they're aware of in editing and they realized it. It's driving me crazy. I'm also very tired, so I'm low on spoons, but hear me out. I don't know what they're about to say, but I would say that love in the way that I perceive it in relation to other people or even to myself is about how much and how connected we are to those people, but how much of them that we see and understand. And it's about that connectivity. I remember when I met my inner circle people, like my friends who are not related to me, there was always something distinctly different about them. I made a lot of friends growing up, guys. I've met so many people in my life that have been so amazing. But when I met these particular people, they stood out to me. Something about them was so distinct and it was almost like they were a different, like just different, like a different flavor, a different connectivity. But honestly, it was about seeing each other. I felt a different connection with them. And it's not how often we talk. It's not how often we get along. It's not how often we agree. It's like, it's like if I'm going to fight with anyone, if I'm going to battle differences with anyone, I will do it with you and I want to know you until you die, but I also want to know your consciousness. I want to do all the good times with you and all the bad times, but still have really respectable boundaries because you're friends, right? And friends are in some ways a lot easier to like find in a journey, some, some ways because you're finding special people, but I found three of them. And every time I met one of them, I was like, something about you is different. I don't know what it is yet, but something about you is different. And that's interesting to me. Even when I connected with my partner, I remember thinking, I remember telling him, hey, I think you might be another inner circle person or you might be my husband. And what do you think about that? And he was like, yeah, I think you're really significant to me. I mean, we had a significant meeting and it was just over like, guys, it was a conversation. And it was a conversation that made us go, hey, I think you might be one of those people, like what people might call like a soulmate, only I have them platonically and romantically. And I didn't have those with my other partners. It was something I had to discover over time. Even with one of my besties, that's like the latest person to come into my inner circle. I remember talking to him. I remember getting off the phone. I remember going to my now ex-partner and saying, I just talked to somebody who is so different than anyone I've ever met there's something special about him, but I don't know what it is. He was really weird, but in like a very special way, not weird like a person, but weird because unique. And I was like, what is that? And funny enough, like he became inner circle and the guy I was dating, I dumped him because I never had that with him. My partners would ask me when I was dating them, like, why aren't you going to marry me? And I was like, something is wrong. Like, I don't even get that. I don't get that feeling with you. But I realized as I aged, it was not just a feeling. It was a connectivity. It was a connection. It was an understanding. It was like a unique experience, right? Something that was like almost profound. And I feel it with all my siblings and my parents. And I'm very happy about that. Can I tell you? I would be sad if I didn't have that with my siblings or my parents. Lots of people don't. Lots of people do, do, people do not have special connections with their blood relatives. And with my family, with my parents and my siblings, I definitely feel like I have that. And I think all my siblings and family have that as well, um, mostly. Like, I think they do from my understanding, um, from the way that I understand my family. I think they would agree on that point. And then they've all been like my brother. When he married his wife, my sister-in-law, 
she was so spe- she was the chosen one like she was one of his soulmates she was so specifically like quote unquote made for him that I really believe in that kind of connection I see it with my parents I see it with my friends parents I see it with my relationship there are just people who come into your life and they are profoundly unique and they are the people that I can unconditionally love no matter what they do they will never do anything to make me ever kick them out of my life that is a very specific connection there are so many people that I'm like I don't like the way you chew I'm not gonna be friends with you anymore like I will break up friendships over like we're just not hanging out enough by well I'll make I'll make like there will be any weird reason not to be friends with people to dump somebody But with these people, like, it doesn't matter what they do. I will visit you in prison if you do something horrific. I will love you no matter what. I could not even, I don't even care if they throw a tantrum and stab me. Like, I love you so much. I don't know why you're stabbing me. Why are you doing this? And it's not even a delusion. It's like a radical acceptance of their consciousness. It's not a delusion. It's the opposite. It's a radical acceptance of like every, even when you fuck up, I radically accept this about you, my bro. Like in a way that I'm like, I'm happy to be on this journey with you. You're such a freak right now, but I'm happy to be on this journey with you. I have those very special people in my life. I love them so much that they can do wrong and I would still visit them in prison. It's not that they always do right. It's that even when they do wrong, I still love them and I get it. I was listening to Smith's panel talk about unconditional love. And these people were saying that even if they were a parent and their kid became a serial killer, they wouldn't love their kid the same. And I was like, why? What does it matter if your kid's a serial killer? Right? Like, what would it matter if you had a child? That'd be so sad for your child and for the world. But why would your love differ? And it's because you're not having that special connection I'm talking about, that unconditional love That unconditional love, I think it's real, but I don't think it's with every kind of relationship. I don't think it happens with every parent or child. I don't think it happens with every partnership. I don't think you find it like with every kind of person. I was only going to marry someone who could unconditionally love me and I could love them unconditionally. So even if my partner and I abused each other and we had to separate, like we would unconditionally love each other from a distance versus my other exes. I never think about them. I, I, I don't ever need to hear from them again. I never we moved on the version of me that loved those people They're She's dead. Like, I don't want a connection with my exes. Like, what? Move on. Don't call me. Like, don't reminisce about the past with me. So again, when I think about unconditional love, I really think of it as a special, profound connection that not all people have which is why it's really hard to have a conversation about this because you would assume that a parent and a child would have it. But I have seen parents and children not have unconditional love for each other, not have a connection. You know, I'm telling you, there's something really profoundly different. I can't leave my friendships. Like I can't leave my siblings. I can only create a distance. I can only have boundaries. But I can't pretend they don't exist. Guys, I'm I'm telling this right now. If I saw one of my exes in public, I would literally pretend I didn't know them or unless they made contact with me. I would never feel a desire to talk to one of them again. Like what the fuck do I want to talk to you for? Right? If I saw one of my siblings in public, I would not only run up to them and give them a noogie, but I'd be like, what up, bitch? Like it would they, bleh, bleh. they're connected to me in such a profound way. If I ran into one of my besties, I'd be like, oh my God, like it'd be so specific. But like even people I have literally like thought about marrying, like I'm not that per girl, go away. Our story is done. Go away. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Firstly, there's an asymmetry. We're watching Khadija. I totally derailed their video. Tree that I noticed when a lot of y'all, not just y'all, but in general, when any of us talk about- What, Selena? I don't think my mom would visit me in prison and she's a lawyer, girl. My condolences. You know, how can you tell if they have unconditional love or maybe they're both just playing out their thing? It's you. You have to know. And then you have to have it has to be symbiotic. I think it has to be symbiotic in a way and in the way that I mean it to be. I think you maybe you could have one sided unconditional love for someone. Um, But I think acting on it would be inappropriate in a way. Um, but I think there is like symbiotic, unconditional love you feel for one another. You know what I mean? And I think it's an experience you're having. It's a shared experience. You are having a shared experience in a, in a very profound way. But I do think you could one-sided, unconditionally love somebody. Um, I think that's probably more than probable, right? I can think of a few people I would probably put under that category. Um, but that's not the same 
right? Because that's kind of like un- 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 one-sided unconditional love is difficult. Though you can practice it in a healthy way by having an, an attachment to that unconditional love. If you get obsessed with that unconditional love and therefore you think you are owed something because you unconditionally love someone, I think that's really dangerous. You know what I mean? Henry says, can you explain the unconditional love of God of, for Jesus, but God was willing to kill his Jesus for the world? I'm asking for an atheist perspective and if that is the same idea of unconditional love. Um, yeah, I just think that's all kind of crazy, right? Like I, I wouldn't kill my child for the world, right? I don't, I think that idea of like Jesus, like so unconditionally loved the world that he like, you know, I just think that is like a human's way of thinking they're more important than even like God's son. I think it's like narcissism religion. I think religion is us being so afraid that we need to imagine God would kill his own son for us. And I think that's just like narcissism. I don't think that's really healthy. I think it's poetic and it can be seen as healthy. But I think it's like not what I'm talking about, right? I could see it though if I in good faith translated it to even though you're my son, I'm willing to hold you accountable for your sins against the world. And I love you unconditionally, but I also have to do what's right within values. But Jesus didn't sin against the world. So it doesn't quite make sense. Though you could argue that Jesus sinned against the Romans or the Jews and therefore give to Caesar what is Caesar's. I I think it's a bad example, but I think loving unconditionally is more like the Old Testament God who before Jesus like loved his people enough to start the world over in a way, but maybe not. Maybe he just unconditionally loved himself. It's just like it's hard for me to have that. You know what I mean? Um, To have that conversation with it. Because. Again, like the way that I grew up in religion, the way I did Bible study, the way I understand theology, though minimal, religion is a narrative of the human being expressing God's love. So, you know, it's not the same, you know, do you guys want to explain it in a different way? You know what I mean? If you guys feel like I'm explaining it wrong, I feel like the way you're explaining it in relation to what I'm saying is not the same. But if you guys want to explain it in a different way, you can do that. But remember that understanding of theology is like the relationship you're having with theology. So it's been a long time since I've been in Bible study. You know what I mean? Um, I heard about unconditional love through religion as well for the first time, but I don't adhere to that version of unconditional love because I don't think it's, it makes sense to my brain to relate it to that. You know what I mean? So, I don't know if somebody has a different relationship with it, but I don't see how that's what I would say, you know, unconditional love is. About love in that we are constantly talking from a place of how we want to be loved and what kind of partner we want. But how many of us stop and go, wait, am I the kind of partner that would be would be valuable or good for somebody? Am I doing the work on myself to be that kind of partner that I'm expecting? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm excluded from that. These are all things that I've thought about. We talk from a place of what we want and not always from a place of what we have to offer and to give. And speaking of that expectation of how we want to be loved and cared about versus thinking about what we have to offer and give, heterosexual romantic relationships are oftentimes a really clear sight of asymmetry when it comes to who is giving more in an emotional capacity and in other aspects, but largely in an emotional one versus who is not. A lot of times men will not understand the emotional labor and work that is going into the relationship that their partner is providing and therefore not see that there is some asymmetry there. And if one person is constantly giving and the other is taking and isn't aware, what happens to love in those kinds of relationships? I was rereading all about love for this book and we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment because the girls who know, know. She pointed out something interesting about, and I think this book was written in the 90s. So the height of relationship, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, relationship guides and all that sort of stuff. But she points out that men who would write in this sort of relationship self-help section would often write from a place of receiving love 
whereas women would largely write from a place of their lack of receiving. And that's a very heterosexual, romantic, monogamous relationship because the other issue with our definitions of love is that it separates love into all these different hierarchies. A lot um, love can be a hierarchy. Thank you. A lot of people pointed out that there's familial love, there's romantic love, there's platonic. <gasps> thank you, Lone Wolf. Hey, Brittany, just want to say your OnlyFans is bomb. Ellen, in your body is chef's kiss. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, because I've been working out. It's going to get even better. But also, thank you. Love. Except for my ace Aero girlies who were like, but isn't it all the same? Like, don't you just love everybody? This I don't understand. Not every ace Aero person that was in the comments said this, but a lot of y'all were saying this. And this is something that I often think about and believe as well. And we tend to prioritize and value certain types of love over others by separating them into these different categories. And it's not that I'm saying folks are intentionally trying to say only some people matter more in their lives than others. Um, I'm literally saying that. Not to be so like neurodivergent, but I'm literally saying that. Maybe some of you are, but I am. I've never understood why familial love is more important than platonic love is more important than romantic love. What well, it's not automatically. It's just dictated by the individual and the relationship they're having with that love. I don't think biological love is as automatically better than like chosen family right I don't believe that I think it's up to you I would argue that I love my husband more than I love my sister and I've only known my husband less than two years I've known my sister her whole life but I love my husband in a way that I can't compare to my sister because I also love my sister more than I love the world and I love my husband more than I love the universe like it's a very specific thing it's like in the same way that my sister should love me more than the world, but love her partner more than me in a way. Like we believe in that kind of love where the love is. I remember I dated some people in the past and they said to me, when am I going to be as important as your sister is to you? And I'm like, have I known you my whole life? Like I've known my sister. And I thought in my 20s that the reason I didn't love my partner was because I didn't know him as long as I knew my sister. And I'm like, that's not what it's about. It's not about timing. It's about how much you can see and you're connected to that person to me, right? So I love my sister in the way that I can love my sister. But the connection between us has limitations because I am not fully intimate with my sister. Obviously, she's my sister. But with my partner, I'm fully intimate with him, completely fully intimate with him. Like everything, every thought, everything. The other day, every, even if I make a noise, he's like, what? What was the thought? Say it out loud. I was like, I was just thinking something. He's like, say it out loud. And it's so fun because then we can talk about everything all day and it feels like very safe to talk about everything all day. And same, when he makes a noise, I was like, what was the thought? Tell me. Oh, interesting. Because like sometimes we feel like we don't want to burden each other with all of our stupid thoughts. And then we're like, no, this person actually wants to know all my stupid thoughts. How exciting. Versus like your siblings and your other people like love them, but there's limitations. Even though my sister and I tell each other so much, there's limitations, right? So again, I love them all and I would fight demons for all of them. But if you were like, and my siblings and I talk about this all the time. Okay, push a button. Who would you save? So-and-so or so-and-so. Okay, like who would you save? It's like, Okay, and then the love you have for people you're protecting is different than the love you have for somebody you're doing life with. So even the love you have with your kid is different. The love you, you know what I mean? Like everyone is different, but I do think it's very, I think it's good. I think it's nice when my siblings say like, I love you, but I'd obviously like save my kids over you. I'm like, yeah, those are your kids, dude. Obviously. Like, what am I supposed to say? Like, I, you knew me before your kids were born. Like, no, bro, you better. You better save your kids before you save me, bro. What are you talking about? Like, I would save your kids before I saved you. What are you talking about? What the world around me taught me about love, thinking that it all had to be separate and different and that my familial love was the most important and then my friends and then eventually it would be romantic love. Ooh, be but you see, saving the kids over you is about the priority we have because the love we have is to save them. That's different than the, ooh, so love is so different, right? All oh, the nuance of love is so good. The love of the nuance of love is so good because the love you have for children is different than the love you have for your partner. 
it's not that you love your children more than your partner, but the duty you have to your children is greater than the duty you have to your partner. But the duty you have to your relationship is greater than the duty you have to your kids. Like there is something in my bubble, in my bubble, in my bubble. There is something so like nuanced about this. Oh, I'm already loving it, Deja. I'm already loving it. There's something so nuanced about this conversation. So the love is different. Again, it's about connectivity. And then it's about sort of like the kind of love. Ooh, so maybe the love you have you for your children is the kind of love like God has for the world, whatever that metaphor is. I'm too much of a literal thinker to use it, but and then the love you have for your partners is about the connectivity or the consciousness. But then the love I have for my inner circle, the platonic love is so vital to me. Like it's very important to me. Um, but it's not dictated by action alone. Cause guys, like I would give a homeless person like attention if they needed it. Like I would give a person I never met attention. I would give a stranger at a, a supermarket attention if they needed it. It's not that. But then sometimes I wouldn't. Like it's just, it's not about the attention. It's not about, oh, I spend time doing things with you. So that's how you know we're connected. It's like something greater. Hmm. Oh, I love it. Okay. I love the brainstorming. Interesting. Because Kyla and I talked about this on stream the other day when they were interrogating me about destiny. Um, I was like, trying to explain to them because uh what's his name he's really nice L something with an l he like loot what's his name he helps he cooks L something with an l he's in the destiny sphere oh, why can't i remember his name he seems really nice i just i'm really bad with the names and he was saying like you were friends with destiny why did you talk about him and i was like what do you mean like we've known each other through work like what like when I was in Miami and Steven asked and I asked Steven, hey, do you want one on one time with me um, so we can make plans? He was like, well, only if you want one on one time with me. And I was like, oh, I'm good. Because like in my mind, I already made the effort by showing up to Miami. Lycan. Lycan seems really nice. That's who it is. Lycan. Lycan asked me, like, why would you talk about your friend's parenting style or his kids? And I was like, what do you mean? I criticized Andrew Tate and the Kardashians. And he's like, but he was your friend. And I was like, oh, like a loosey goosey friend, but also like Kim Kardashian could be my friend. I would still talk about her. You know what I mean? Like even if Kim Kardashian was my friend, I'd still talk about her. I, like I talk about my siblings or I talk about my parents. Like guys, I criticize my parents like in my job all the time. Like don't you listen to my content? I literally criticize my closest people in my life all the time in my content. Why wouldn't I criticize a YouTube friend? So when I was in Miami, and I already made the effort to be there. And then it was still up to me whether or not I wanted alone time. I took that as like, oh, no, I'm not interested. I'm like, OK, cool. No problem. So I didn't hang out with him one on one because like, why would I? No hard feelings. Like I love a good boundary. Right. No problem. But then Kyla on stream was explaining that because Destiny has given me like five hours of personal time, that to him is like a big deal. But to me, I would do that for a stranger. So like, what's the difference? And that's the thing. When you're connecting with people, you have to make sure you're speaking similar languages. You understand the value of time. You like are exchanging in a symbiotic way that relationship. So I think it's really valid that like for some people, giving you an hour of their time feels like a big deal. But to me, it doesn't always feel that way. But sometimes it can feel that way. Or sometimes it's meant to be a gesture. Like, I don't know. I don't like playing this game of like, oh, if you really wanted to hang out longer, you, he would have like I can't read minds or even if somebody in my siblings goes like hey you hurt my feelings can you tell me why no I'm not guessing I can't do that for you but I know why you want me to do it I just can't do it for you because I'm not that kind of friend sometimes I think when we talk about love we're talking about connectivity we're talking about do you see me enough and then do you like what you see enough to still want to hang out with me and spend time with me and for me when I unconditionally love someone yes when I don't no when I unconditionally love you, yeah, like I'll even like sit around and explain to you why I don't like the way you're communicating and I love you and I want to hang out with you, but we have to communicate a certain way. Like I, when I unconditionally love people, will make the effort. When I love and like people, I will make somewhat of the effort. But for new, 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 new friendships, you're going to lose me very quickly if you don't make enough of the effort. You know what I mean? Because like, again, I already have so many good people in my life. And because of the love I have for those people, I don't need new people taking up space where they're going to, again, make me do all the emotional labor, right? Because like that's the burden of friendship that I'm willing to take on. I'm willing to do emotional labor for you, but it's got to be symbiotic in a really authentic way. You know what I mean? And I think that's really hard for people because it is emotional labor. I was watching Cody Co. review these couples that have broken up 
And one of the couples, oh my God, wait, I screenshotted it for you guys. Hold on. Resentment. You made some significant sacrifices that you felt were Okay, I made significant sacrifices in our relationship that went underappreciated, unappreciated, okay? That's the prompt. And then the exes, these are ex people, deviated between yes and no. Unappreciated, unnoticed. Yes. Um, we started dating. We so this is one couple. It was like 45. It's crazy how many adult relationships just corrode over dishes and laundry and just household chores. It's crazy. How, how many relationships do you think corrode because of that? Like a significant percentage. Five minutes away from each other and I would drive to you every weekend. You came. Okay. So I think he's so right. And that's because one, it's not unconditional. And two, it's okay that it's conditional because that's what dating is for. I think if your relationship erodes over dishes, it wasn't unconditional, but also it might be unconditional and also not doing the dishes is a form of abuse. You can unconditionally love someone and stay out of their life because they're abusive. So if you not doing dishes is a part of an abuse tactic, right? Versus you just not doing dishes because you guys don't have the like willingness to sit down and talk about things. Again, the sign of a real friend is someone who sits down and talks it through with you. Not someone who blocks you, refuses to talk to you, doesn't engage. That's a sign of somebody that's not like that's not a friendship, right? Especially at the first bad thing that happens. And that's okay. But that's what I mean to say when I say like as much as I appreciate the gesture of saying like we're friends, real friends don't burn the bridge after the first mistake right? That's not what friendship does. And if that's the kind of way you have friends, like that's not good enough for me. But I can understand why it's good enough for some people. Magic Dragon says I had a deep talk with a buddy at work once and he called me his best friend after that. And I was like, slow down, bud. I will do this for anyone. That's the problem. As somebody who does that for just basically like anyone who needs space or time, that's why I think I like doing my calls. It can feel like we're friends. But what we are is like, what is a friend, right? Anyway, let's talk about the emotional labor aspect of it because this conversation blew my mind between this couple. Let's listen. In my apartment once did the what, like six months we were together at that time. Um, I flew from overseas to see you, spent like $2,300 or $2, on a plane ticket and you felt like you were doing me a favor by not charging me rent for the month that I was staying with you, even though I just paid. Okay, that's crazy. I joked with my partner. I was like, um, I should charge you rent for being with me in Arizona for a month. Because like, what? Like, okay, crazy. Like two or two grand to come see you. No, I appreciate you for driving that much. Like, I'll admit I didn't like your apartment. I didn't like driving. I think it's less about me doing it than how you're responding to me doing it. Like, I never felt appreciated. And Mia, you're on yes as well. You also feel like you made significant sacrifices that weren't appreciated? Yeah, I mean, I fucking didn't charge her rent. She stayed with me for a month. <laughs> <laughs> didn't charge her a cent. I think like emotional labor. No, emotional I don't. labor? No idea what you're talking about. I don't, I. Watch, watch this convert. I blew my mind. Honestly, cannot imagine a single sacrifice you made for our relationship. Is this about our intimacy? Yeah. <sighs> That's not a, a sacrifice. No, but you. it is though. Cause it's like, like it was like, Either it's going to happen your way or it's not going to happen at all. Bottoming is like not something I want to do all the time. And like it, I had to in order to be intimate with you. And there was no like equalness to that whatsoever. And I like was trying to be respectful of the fact that like you weren't comfortable with your body at the time, which is why I did it. But I'm saying that's like a lot of emotional labor to like go through. The intimacy. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I just can't see it that way because I don't. You're not, you didn't, I had such like gender confusion. It was insane. And what was going on inside of my brain and how I felt about myself was worlds larger than anything that you could have been experiencing because you couldn't. What the fuck? That's emo emotional abuse. So to me, that is trauma. So a few things are happening here, right? Either they're abusing their partner, like deliberately abusing their partner right now by discounting their feelings, saying my problems were bigger than yours, or they're so trapped in their trauma, like so trapped in the cycle of their own trauma that no one else's pain matters but theirs, and that's still by proxy abusive, right? So cruel. This is the most cruel interaction I've seen with people who literally like could say that. 
Like, I just feel like this is the cruelest thing I could ever say to my partner. I would feel so guilty because of my own values if I said something like this to somebody. Like, it's like, what? Like, yeah, it's one thing to be like, bro, I was going through it, but like, I understand. Like, that's okay. But this, like, total invalidating. Under, I understand. Like, sometimes you're in the heat of it. I'm going to give some leeway and be open-minded. Sometimes you say things like, bro, I was really going through it, so I, like, need you to pick up the pieces. Or like, hey, I can't be here for you right now. But to say, like, there's no way you were going through anything that needed to be validated is kind of crazy. You didn't go down on me. I'm being honest. Like, there's no way in the world that you felt as intensely about that as I felt as intensely about how shitty I felt about my body. You're literally telling me that how I felt about it doesn't matter because it pales in comparison to your journey with it's it. It's not that it doesn't matter, but what are you sacrificing from not topping me? Okay, like, imagine not being able to top someone that you love. You're a top. Yeah. So it was like my first queer relationship yeah, and course. I was figuring things out. And yeah. so it was like my identity in my room for growth was not a thing that could happen because of like exterior circumstances. And that sucked for me. And I felt like I, like you only wanted me to be a very specific version of myself mm -hmm. that was in the way that you could have it. And I had to put everything that I was. This is real, man. Holy <laughs> shit. I'm sorry. I'm not I love when Cody's like, holy shit, people have problems. Weighing in too much here. I just don't feel like I'm well versed enough to weigh in on a queer relationship. But I wonder if they knew that this was going to happen on this video. Probably, you know. Was to the side to accommodate that. Does that make sense? Mm -mm. Is it because. Does it make sense? No. Fuck. The lack of extrospection, the lack of consideration, the lack of self-awareness. This is what I'm saying. Is this why you guys all feel lonely in relationships? No fucking wonder. I would feel, I feel alone in this relationship. I'm not even dating this person. That's what I'm saying. No wonder there's a loneliness epidemic. What the fuck is this conversation, bro? <laughs> Sorry. It does. I think it makes, I think it does make sense. I think they're both making good points, it feels like. Next prompt is. Isn't that crazy? Tell me here. I'll, I'll share that video in the chat so you guys can check it out. But is that not the craziest video? I was shook to my core. Like we all talk about this loneliness epidemic. What is love? What is hello? That's insane. That was like one of the I saw that today and I was like. It's so cruel. It's so cruel to just completely invalidate somebody and then be like. I, my pain is more than your pain. I'm in more pain. And it's like, yes, if you are unable to be there for somebody, you should let them know. Like when I was sick, when I was getting diagnosed, I couldn't emotionally support people at the time. Um, my brain fog was so bad. My mental health was like really, uh, bad in relation to chronic health, like specifically in relation to like just trying to sleep and go to work. And my brain got so foggy. I called my best friend of 20 something years and I was like, I am so embarrassed. When is your birthday? And she was like, what? I was like, I am having such bad brain fog. And I was crying because I was like, I can't remember your goddamn birthday. And I celebrated it every year since I was nine years old. I was so like brain foggy during that diagnosis time. And she was like, Brittany, it's literally not a big deal. Who fucking cares when my birthday is? I was like, don't say that because like, da, 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 da. I was so sad. But it was like, I could not be there for people. So there were moments when I had to explain to people, I can't be here for you right now. And I feel awful about that. But I also know I need to take care of myself. This girl, this girl, this human, whatever their gender is, not Khadijah, the other one we just watched literally invalidated their partner's feelings and literally were like, but you have to be there for me. I don't need to be there for you. Outrageous to be like, you never sacrificed anything or that it shouldn't impact you. Just like so selfish, bro. So selfish. So weird. Mm. Be more important than platonic. Okay, if you guys just joined, we're watching Khadijah's video on love. We just skipped for a minute to Cody Ko to show an example of somebody, but now we're back to Khadijah. Platonic friendship love. And then once I got a partner did the traditional heteronormative thing, got married, whatever. <sighs> that partner in our family unit is the most important, then my outside family, and then friends. It's interesting to note. Oh, wait. I got to love would be more. Love was the most important, and then separate romantic love. What the world around me taught me about love, thinking that it all had to be separate and different, and that my familial love was the most important, 
and then my friends, and then eventually it would be romantic love would be more important than platonic friendship love. And then once I got a partner, did the traditional heteronormative thing, got married, whatever, that partner in our family unit is the most important, then my outside family, and then friends. It's interesting to note how few millennials and Gen Z are getting married or having kids, and if so, are doing it much later. And so many folks are thinking more about community and raising families together. And Look, I love people, but even when I was poly, and even the poly couples I know, most of them do not raise their kids literally together. So I just want to make sure we're all talking in the same way. Raising your kids with a village is not the same thing as allowing other people to parent your children in the same exact way, right? So like even in poly circles, the ones I know who have kids, there's only two parents, right? There's only two parents and you, cause usually more than three and it just gets crazy. Even with step siblings and step parents and step things like, do you guys remember big girls don't cry? Big girls don't cry. Do you remember the movie? How there's like, who's the parent? And it's like eight parents because they've all been remarried and divorced a thousand times. That is my childhood. I've watched that movie a thousand times. Even in that film, there's actually like the parents and then there's the village. So I just want to clarify when people are saying like, oh, we're raising our kids as a village. Do you mean like literally? Or do you just mean like in the like Asian way, like in the Middle Eastern way? And like, yeah, my aunties and uncles helped raise, like I helped raise my nephews and nieces, but at the same time, like they have parents right? Like they do have parents and those are the parents who get to make the final decisions. Or is it like this weird hippy dippy love where like no one has a kid and we all have kids? Like I don't know in what way they mean, right? Because that's how I run my relationship. Like my romantic relationship has the priority because we're they're the only one I'm doing life with. Like I love my friends, but I'm not doing real life with you. I'm doing some of my life with you. My friends and I share some of our life together. Our timelines sometimes match up, but like my person and I, we're always together 24 seven. We are literally doing our daily life together. Our everything is around each other. And it's not about the physical time I spend with my friends, but literally my friends don't call me and update me on every decision they're making in their life. It's not like they tell me today I pie or today I ate like what like I don't need to know what you're doing with your savings account or what you're investing in your 401k like that's not my business so when I say like my my partner is my priority it's because it's my life I'm prioritizing myself I'm prioritizing my life that's why it matters that I prioritize my partner because we're doing life we're doing my life together and we're doing his life together I do not care how my friends spend their money I care about how my partner spends his money because it's going to impact my life you know what I mean? Like my, I don't control what my friends do with their life. So that's why it matters. And that's why your kids don't matter as much as your partner, because they're going to do their own thing. I'm not going to tell my child at 30 how to spend their money. That's their business. But my partner, I'm going to tell him how to spend his money at 60 because that's our money. You know what I mean? So anyways. Doing these non-traditional ways of cohabitating and of loving in a way that feels a bit more egalitarian across the board than organizing your love for people into hierarchies and categories. Again, we will talk about my personal definition in just a moment. We're almost there. I know you've been holding out for a while, but it's not more important to me than my friend love. And that love is not more important to me than any romantic love that I would have. And that love is not more important to me than any love that I would have for myself. And that love should not be more important to me than any love I would have for humanity. But that feels insane to me. And it feels like a lie. I think it's a cope. I don't believe you. I think I love all humans and I love all of humanity, but it is on a hierarchy because it's a cope. Because at the end of the day, like, I wouldn't let my sister be homeless. Do I go around saving the homeless? No. Like, I wouldn't let my there are things I do to protect the people in my life because I love them at a higher hierarchy than other people. I wouldn't visit every person in jail. I don't love them that way. I visit my fa I visit my inner circle in jail. So like I just think it's a cope. Like if Khadija feels that way, then like why aren't we best friends? Because they don't love me like that. They don't know me like that. Right? So I feel like it's kind of a cope to say we all love each other the same. I love all of humanity and all animals and everything that's alive, but on a spectrum, right? Like I do love everything that's alive. I love myself. I love you. I love everything. 
but I don't love you guys all the same. Like I can't, I just can't. But unfortunately, because the way we define love is so broad, I say that and y'all are probably like, bitch, how the heck you gonna say that you could love everybody the same and blah, blah, blah. It can't be the same. It can be love though. I do love everybody, but it's not the same. So I'm curious on what they're gonna say about that. Blah, blah, blah. That's not love. Love is used to define and describe so many things that I don't think we often mean love when we're saying it. I mm. love my cats. I love pole dancing. I love singing. I love sitting in silence sometimes and just staring off into space. I love smoking that weed. That isn't necessarily the same thing as the love that I have for people. Mm -hmm. We often use love to describe so many things and because of that, it means so many different things to so many different people. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it's hard to get on one page about what a definition is. And mm -hmm. because of that, makes it really hard to have love for other people and each other and to say that to somebody and be on the same page. Because if you have a definition of love and I have my own definition of love, if we're both taking it for granted that we have the same definition, assuming that we both have lived the same lives, which we have not, that's ground rife for miscommunication, confusion, and a unstable love. So how do we get a more stable love? It's the moment you've all been waiting for. I'm finally gonna tell you what love is. <laughs> it's interesting, Khadija's very different in this video, right? Am I crazy? I don't watch a lot of their content, but I watch enough of it. Why does this video feel so different? Like a lot, wilder, like a lot less concise, I guess. It feels a lot more immature than normal, which is great. I love immaturity, but also I'm not used to that in their videos. Like their videos are usually like pretty concise. I thought that was interesting. I wonder what it is about love. <laughs> Let's go to the next part. <laughs> it has taken me at least five years. To oh, her mic, I mean, their mic wasn't recording, so it's gonna be weird for audio. Really think about and define love for myself. When I say I love you, I mean that love is a space of mutual creation where the desire is to nurture the spiritual journey of all the people in said space. So let me break that down. Love is a space of mutual creation. If we are in relation to each other, romantic, familial, platonic, you are a co-creator of this relationship dynamic. When you and I come together, we are two different people coming together and we are creating a whole new space together with our relationship. If mm -hmm. you and I- Creating a bubble, if you will. Care about each other. If you and I respect each other's agency, then we see that we both are creating this space. Which means sometimes you're gonna tell me things that I don't like. Sometimes I'm gonna tell you things that you don't like, but we're honest with each other about it. And it's not honesty to the point of brutality. It's honesty with compassion. It's honesty with care. And it's you and I are in this together. So how do we want this relationship to look? And again, that can be platonic, familial, or romantic. If you are a parent creating a relationship with your child, that is something. Yeah, um, Obscurity says empathy. Yeah, is it, aren't they just describing empathy more than love? Like it's, I'm not understanding how this is specifically love more than empathy, which I guess you could say is empathy a, a tree branch of love or is love a tree branch of empathy? Hmm. Something that you were, sorry, there's something in my eye, hold up. If you are a parent creating a relationship with your child, that is something that you are doing in collaboration with them. We take for granted, I think, oftentimes our familiar relationships as that the love is just <clears throat> inherent. Whereas maybe it might be for our parents and our guardians, and for some of us as kids, immediately too. But for some of us, maybe not. For some of us, your parents were in survival mode, you know? So like the love yous and all that stuff, it wasn't tossed around like that. And people just assume, I'm your family, so I love you. But what does that really mean? Mutual space of creation in this family? I will respect this child. I'm not gonna let this child walk all over me and just act like whatever, because kids need boundaries. Everybody needs boundaries. But I'm also going to respect the fact that they are going to be an autonomous human being. And I am a part of that creation. And I need to show them that they can create that with me so that they grow up feeling like they have agency. If we're in a romantic relationship, the relationship isn't all on my terms. I'm gonna be honest and say how I feel about things. I'm going to ask questions. 
I'm gonna say what I can do and what I can't do. Mm -hmm. If you come to me and you're telling me what you can do, what you can't do, what you want me to do. Yeah, Vert says love just is. I kind of think so. I feel like love just is. And the relationship you have with that love is specific. Um, but I feel like love just is, I'm kind of losing Khadija here. I can't tell if I'm just tired, but like they, I feel like they're not explaining themselves very well right now. Right. Am I, am I following them? Am I confused? Am I the only one confused? I feel like, oh no, Selena wrote confusing. Okay. Like, are we also confused? Cause I feel like it's very hard to follow this conversation, but Raiders cat says 420. I'm sparked up for you, Brittany, since you can't. Thank you. Oh my God. Is it that time? Thank you so much. It's 1.20 a.m. where I am. So I appreciate that. Smoke one, roll one. Thank you. You do when I tell you if I can or can't do that. We are creating this together. But if there isn't honesty, if there isn't open communication, if you're not telling me how you feel, if you're not treating me like you're an active participant of the relationship and more so like somebody just going along for the ride with whatever I say, then it doesn't work, you know? Friendships are the exact same way. If we're friends, you gotta be able to say what you need and what you want to. You gotta be able to push back, do whatever you need because you are a co- Okay, I think they're describing a symbiotic relationship, which is good. Creator in the space. And that means there's gonna be hiccups. That means that things are gonna not always be great. Things are gonna go left sometimes. But it also mean that, means that things are gonna be really great sometimes too. You're a mutual creator and we're creating this together. The next part, the desire is to nurture the spiritual journey of everyone in said space. So we've created this space together and now we have a desire to nurture our spiritual. No, my definition of love is better. Love is a relationship of connectivity. I love every living thing because I am a living thing. Okay, I love you in partially, partial to how I love myself because I know I am a living thing and I know you're a living thing. I know blade grass is a living thing. I know a mushroom is a living thing. And I know we're all just like living things. I consider a mushroom a living thing. I know it's a fungus. I think everything is alive and everything has a life, a spirit, and a name. And love is about connection and connectivity. And the deeper the connection, the deeper the love. And I think that's why when you find someone you're really connecting with, you're like, oh my God, this is the first time someone's treated me nicely. This is the first time we've connected. It feels like the most profound love and then it implodes because it was actually toxic and a toxic connection. You're connecting on that toxicity, which is a version of toxic love, but it's still love. And the question is, is like, is the connection you're making with this person a kind of healthy love? I think the healthier the love, the greater the connection, the more profound the connection as well. And I think seeing people is a part of that love. So I think love is a relationship of seeing and connectivity and then how you have that love can be healthy or toxic and it can be deep or shallow it can be small or it can be like profound it can be very many things but I think it's about connectivity like I love everyone because they're a living thing and I'm a living thing and I think everything is alive I think rocks are alive and the universe is alive because the universe is a living entity and everything within that universe is alive so even though we describe alive alive differently on the micro like I think when you die, you're like recycled energy and you go back into the earth and you feed the earth with your like body. And that's a version of like sustaining life and like sustaining a life is love. And like love is us. Like we are love. So you know what I'm saying? Like I, could you just confusing me? Journey through it. The nurturing of the spiritual journey is of course from Bell Hooks is all about love because the girls who know know. But this book was great in helping me understand and articulate how I wanted to define love going forward in my life. And the nurturing of the spiritual growth is so important because firstly, spirituality, it doesn't necessarily mean God. I am not religious. I don't believe in God. I'm like, human beings can't conceive of a God that we've named. Girl, please. But I do have faith. The faith is in humanity for some odd reason, or the faith is in enough people in humanity. I don't know. Some people say it's foolish, whatever. If I wanna nurture your spiritual growth, if I have a desire to do that, I care about you being you, the best version of you. And it doesn't mean that I know what that version is, only you can know that, but we are all better versions of ourselves when we're able to understand other people and meet them with compassion, grace, and accountability. If you are here whiling, I don't just take you treating me any which way. I compassion means to suffer with, and I agree with this. I just don't think we have an obligation to give it to all people, and I think it's really dangerous to think we can. I think you have to give it to people in which it's symbiotic. 
So in which it makes sense. So even when I'm helping somebody and it's more in a mentor position, they're still giving me their desire to be better and they're using me as a tool to find that wisdom or whatever you want to call it, that information, which is a symbiotic relationship. So yes, I give you information. You actually like try to utilize information and then you give me back whatever didn't work. And then we go in the symbiotic, like a mentor and a mentee have a symbiotic relationship, right? Um, when you have a symbiotic relationship, I think it it's successful. When it's not symbiotic, it's like not meant to be. Find somebody can be symbiotic with. And I think that's a more neutral way to look at it. It's not about who's right or who's wrong or who's toxic. Just think, is it symbiotic? Are we actually like working with each other and is it working for each other? And if it isn't, like you got to find it with somebody else, right? Have you reached out to Khadija? I'd like to see a collab with them or even on or even have them on a panel. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to have them on a uh, uh, on something. I, I don't know. I, I have a really hard time sending out emails. FD Signifier was in my stream the other day and I said I would send an email and I didn't send an email yet. Oh, my God. So I need, I'm like, I'm really bad at sending emails. I'll get to it. Spoons. I'll get to it. You know, oh, spoons. Again, everybody needs boundaries. I have boundaries with you. I let you know what I can do. What no, I, I don't have boundaries with people. I have boundaries with myself. I have, I have negotiations with people. I have boundaries with myself. So like, um, my boundary is like, I don't engage in behavior that puts me in a position that X, Y, Z happens. So I keep myself away from certain people and certain people can decide if they can engage differently with me because I have these boundaries for myself, but my boundaries are for me to stay healthy and consistent and people can work around my boundaries for myself or not. And I totally get it. But that's also about that symbiotic relationship, right? I can't do what I will put up with what I won't. You do the same. And we eventually come to mutual ground with each other or we realize we're not compatible and we don't bother. My spiritual growth has looked like being around people that challenge the way that I think, that allow me to open up and not just say, I'm open-minded, I like people, I'm kind, I'm compassionate, but really act in that way. Folks that have made me stop and think, huh, sometimes I might actually be trash. They obviously wouldn't call me trash. I have told y'all that I had was diagnosed with BPD last year. And what? what did they say? obviously wouldn't call me trash. I have told y'all that I had was diagnosed with BPD last year. Khadija has the bedid? Khadija has the bedid? No way, bro. Siblings, bro. We're basically twins, bro. Khadija has the bedid? There's no way, bro. Let's go, bro. Well, now I will reach out to them even more. Bro. Here. And it was a lot. I I wonder if they're how far they are into DBT or remission or whatever they're doing. Shut up, bro. Let's go, bro. I've made friends and lost friends and or just not talk to people as much, whatever. I'm now at a place where the friends that I'm making and the people that I am. You know, this kind of makes sense for their journey about love then. I bet they are doing DBT or some form of it because I will tell you radical acceptance makes you want to love people, bro. Okay, I love that. I this make the video makes sense now. Now, see the the BPD stuff. Now it's making sense. Okay, reconnecting with that I was close to before and all of that are folks that I can be this person. I can have a BPD freak out. I can have a moment. They're not going to hold it against me, or they're not afraid of it. But at the same time, they're not. You didn't know she was BPD? No. I mean, they, it's a they. Yeah, yeah. Stop fucking me up on pronouns. I already suck at keeping up with pronouns. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. I'm so behind. They have borderline personality disorder. I only watch like every so many videos from Khadija. I, there are certain people I only watch so many videos of. And I just, I missed the BPD episode. I'm just going to let me act like a child and not hold me to account. They're going <laughs> to hold me accountable, but they're also going to have compassion. And for me, that allows me to feel safe to have my feelings around them, these very strong feelings. Yes, that are hard. which is why I do not punish people who have episodes. Even on my Discord, we all know people have had bad days. I've yelled, you've yelled, we've all yelled. And then what we realize is like, we're not going to hold it up against each other. I would never think about holding it against anybody for having like a moment, like breakdown, move on. It's no big deal. Like we'll move on. Like, I just think that's so important, but I think it comes from compassion. It comes from like, oh, 
I know what it's like to have like a meltdown or an autistic meltdown or like a, a over sensory overload meltdown or like no big deal. It's not a big deal. Everybody chill. Like we're not going to hold that against you. We're not going to be like, um, remember on July 15th how you broke down? Like that's not going to be something I'm going to tolerate in my community. We don't hold it against people for being human, but we can hold people accountable if they don't or aren't self-aware that they did something. You know what I mean? Um, and at the same time, I don't always think my Discord is like a great space for people. So like if you're not a vibe or like you're conflicting too much with people, it's not symbiotic. Like I don't always recommend the space for you. Not all good people get along, right? You know, but I do not want to hold people like oh, it over their head because they had a moment, you know. <gasps> what are my earrings? Um, They're the female form. They're like a woman um, inspired by Mia. I follow them or she on Instagram and she has like great earrings. They're really amazing. Really recommend. To have around people, and let alone articulate, it allows me to have these feelings through be vulnerable. And then that vulnerability builds more trust. And the more I trust them, the more we're able to keep having and building upon this relationship. And so I'm growing and becoming better because I'm learning, you know what? Khadija, people are safe and they're not going to abandon you and you can have your emotions around them and you can talk to them and be honest and tell them how you feel about things or tell them if they've done something that upset. Okay, just on this note, I had um, a homie go through um, like a cohort situation in college, cohort, and in their class, the class kind of encouraged them to talk about like their past trauma and feelings. And it caused a lot of fake connection with people in which they had given each other these intimate details about their lives, like truly intimate details. And then when the cohort graduated and they all went their own direction, a lot of people felt abandoned by that. And I do think it's really important to recognize like some people are only meant to be in your life for a moment. And also we have to be very cautious about how organized like organizations kind of force intimacy on people, whether it's at church or at school or in other places, because I don't think like I think we're all so eager to be like vulnerable with each other, but I think it's really important when to be and who to be with. And also it's okay to temporarily be vulnerable with someone and then move on with your life as well. And so I just wanted to add that in because Khadija just it just reminded me of that reality of like, yes, people aren't going to abandon you, but also people are allowed to leave. Something I had to learn with my borderline journey is that just because you're intimate with people for a time in your life doesn't mean they're always going to be with you and they're not obligated to be. People are allowed to move on with their life because, again, we're all about unconditional love. And when will we find that person who never leaves me no matter how badly I act? And when will I not? It's like it's not about that. It's about respecting I think like Khadija said, the environment we curate together because we're both curating it together, right? And so I think what's important is that we recognize it for what it is, which is why I'm very okay with friends moving on. Because again, unless you're inner circle, and even if you are, like I understand your desire to move on with your life. I think I'd be very shocked if anyone in my inner circle genuinely wanted to stop talking forever. Um, but I wouldn't be shocked if they were like, hey, I'm going to go do my own thing for 10 years. I'd be like, bye, love you, call me later. But like if they genuinely never wanted to talk again, I'd be like, oh, why? Right? Versus like other friends, if they were like, I'm ready to move on. I'm like, I love you. Thank you for this time. Have a good life, you know? So just a reminder that I think for me when I was recovering through BPD, one thing I had to learn is like radically accept this moment in time for what it is instead of what we hope it will be or anything like that, you know what I mean? Sets you and they're still gonna be around and they're gonna let you know if what they can do is, is possible or not, or they're gonna let you know if how you said it or what you said was cool or not. And they're still gonna love you. And that, oh, oh my God, I'm about to get so emotional. I love my friends. <laughs> if I'm going to say that I love a friend and want to create a space with them and nurture their spiritual growth, I'm going to be honest with them about where I think they could be better at being a better friend. Only if we both consent to having the conversation. Because I really don't think we can see our friends fully all the time. Everyone has a different relationship. I can't. I'll say my shortcoming, or not shortcoming, I just think this is my theory on people, is like I can't see my friends fully because they can't see me fully because, I, again, we're just like not intimate, 
right? Like, I'm sorry, unless we're having sex, you cannot see me fully. Unless you are sharing all of my vulnerabilities, you can't see me fully. I'm deliberately not letting you. I'm deliberately putting a wall up because the only person I want to be that intimate with is my partner. And same with like my besties, like especially my girl besties, like they're not interested in being fully vulnerable with me because they want to share that with someone special, which kind of coincides with having a special person because my friends are special and they are amazing and I'm their 2 a.m. calls 1000%. But at the same time, like they're hoping to find partners to share that special stuff with. Like they are hoping to find partners to literally do that with so they don't do it with me because they don't want to have sex with me. As much as like you should want to have sex with me. It's like sex is so intimate to us. Sharing that intimacy is so special with us or even not sex, but like something sex adjacent, like cuddling, because like some people might be asexual over here. So it's like, again, like everyone's going to be different, but I agree that the intimacy I have with my friends is profound, but it also has limitations because I need to limit it because I don't want to engage with a person that way. I only want to do it with someone very specific and that's my partner. Right. So I think that's really important to say if we're having this discussion about love. Of course, I love my friends. I love them so much and they love me enough to also like let me go do my thing. And I love them enough to let them go do their thing. But I don't I don't think you can see people fully unless they want you to. But you can see people intimately, even if it's not fully, which I think is very different. I am deliberately putting up a wall. Because I don't want to share that part with someone and I don't think I should be obligated to. I think in some toxic way, there's this idea of like, if we are close friends and if we are very special, you should share everything with me. And it's like, uh, um, no. Because it's a symbiotic relationship, right? It's symbiotic. It has to work for both of us. Um, And I think that's what real love is. Real love is your parents admitting they can't see all of you, right? Because... Even my parents will be like, I know you better than you know yourself. But if they can't validate my queer side, if they can't validate my BPD, if they can't validate my anxiety, if they can't validate my PTSD, like, are they really seeing me or are they just able to love me unconditionally, even though they can't see me fully? I think it's much more profound and special that I love you, even though I can't see all of you. I love you unconditionally, even though I can't see all of you, I think is a much more profound statement for Brittany than saying... I love you because I can see all of you. I love you unconditionally, even though I can't see all of you, because what I can see is enough to feel so connected to you in this lifetime that I would love to grow old with you as a friend, platonically, or as a husband or a wife, but still, or partner, but still there are different kinds of love and different kinds of time spent with one another. Um, Miss Fishy says, I think a lot of people have a hard time with special person concept, especially since it's so romantically tied and it makes people feel less valued if there are walls up. I think that's a problem with them that we all need to work on. I had to work on it with therapy and borderline. People aren't going to abandon you because they're not your like romantic soulmate. You can be platonic and be very valuable, but ultimately like you usually want to have a special person or maybe many if you're poly, especially, you know what I mean? But like special people is like very specific to the consciousness. There's ABLM people on the planet. I've opened to everybody having their special person be their brother or sister or um, friend. But for me, it would be a partner because again, I want to be able to put down all my walls and all of my walls also include sex and intimacy and details about my brain that my siblings and friends like aren't comfortable always hearing or I'm not comfortable sharing. But my partner, he, he wants to hear it all uncensored, all of it. So you know what I mean? Um, Let's see. I've had people ask me, well, aren't you getting, uh, well, aren't you getting from friendship that you would get in a relationship? And I think conceptually it's hard for someone to, some people to accept that romance is that line for some. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah, I think it's not even about, it's like levels of intimacy if romance is too hard for people. I would think of it as like levels of intimacy. Like, again, I can't be as intimate with my friends as I can be with my lovers or as I can be with my lover, my husband, my partner, my girlfriend, like my wife. I can't be as close to somebody I'm having casual sex with as somebody I'm 
pouring my heart out to. I've had sex with people that I am less connected to than my best friends that are platonic that I've sh- I've shared my feelings with. It's like it's the how intimate we're being. And the intimacy isn't about sex or isn't about feelings. It's about how, what, the profoundness of it. So it's not that I have sex with my husband that makes him more intimate. It's that I want to, I want no walls between me and him. Zero walls. But with my friends, again, I need to have boundaries. Those are boundaries I put on myself, right? thing and when i'm being honest with them in that way it's not me saying stuff to make them feel bad put them down let them know that they're not doing enough manipulate them to act the way that i want them to all of that to say that my definition of love is active it's it's not just a feeling because feelings feelings come and go all the time you get a wave of emotion true and then it's gone has khadijah been watching my stuff true to create a space with somebody requires action requires both parties to be motivated. It is creation. It is active in what we're doing. True. It's also not hierarchical because mm. if I'm saying that- Never mind. they're not watching my stuff. <laughs> my definition of love is to create a space and to nurture the spiritual growth of anyone in that space, then anyone that enters that space is going to be treated the same. And I'm meeting you where you are, just like you're meeting me where I'm at. And it can be challenging to meet people where they're, are, where they're at. But that's where the compassion comes in, right? And okay. the kindness and the honesty. Okay, then they're talking about a universal love, which I do agree with. I universally love everyone, but I don't treat everyone the same. And I do have different kinds of love that I express to people for different kinds of reasons. Like I would literally save the life of my cat over a human being I did not know. Because I think we're all he- animals evolved on a planet. And I don't think my li- my cat's life is less important than a human's life. But I think my cat's life is less important in relation to like my husband's life like my husband and I have talked about this like okay if the house is burning down who do you save me or Indiana and he's like "Mm, can we talk about that when we get there and I was like I know because it's hard to choose but Indiana is probably gonna run and she's probably gonna hide under a bed and I'm probably not gonna be able to find her on time versus like saving his life if I had to drag him out of the building or her I'm obviously gonna drag him out of the building first as much as I love Indiana But if I had time to save Indiana over a neighbor, I would save my cat over my neighbor because I don't know my neighbor. I haven't I don't know them. Right. I wouldn't know their name. I wouldn't know where to find them. I wouldn't know how to get into their home. Like I would go find Indiana before I would find my neighbor. And I think that's just the truth of it. Right. Which I think is hard for people to hear. But like that is the truth. But I wouldn't save my cat over my husband. Right. Like in terms of priorities. But I would save my cat over my neighbor because, like, I don't know my neighbor. I don't know where they're at. I don't know. Again, okay, right? Um, See an account of Bye, Raiders. Ability, but the grace. It's also a motivated sort of love because the desire has to be there. Not if I do all of this or say that I'm doing all of this, then they'll behave that I want them to, the way I want them to. Because that's just manipulation. True. True. Oh, I love the radical acceptance language here Khadija's using, which is true. You don't want to be kind to people to manipulate them. You want to radically accept them, meet them where they are, and then hold boundaries. And that's not meeting someone where they're at. The desire, the motivation has to be, yeah, I just, just cause you, you matter and you're important and I care and just cause. And if you can treat yourself in that way, it makes it a lot easier to treat others in that way. If you can. Based. I agree with this. Um, Miss Fishy said, I actually accepted recently. I only get desired the deepest level of intimacy from a romantic connection. Took me a while to actually accept that or accept actually because I've had bubbles tell me it, it was weird to be that way. Is Khadijah saying that? Is Khadijah saying it's wrong to prioritize romantic love or to want total intimacy with a romantic love? Or are they saying that you can have all kinds of relationships with love? Because I'm all about the all kinds of relationships, but it does shock me. When people are in relationships and they want to spend more time with their friends than their partners. Like, I think that is the most shocking part of when people are dating. Because I'm like, you just found the love of your life. You said so. Why are you spending more time with your friends than them? I could not imagine. Like, and none of my friends are that. Well, I don't want to say none of my friends because I want them all to have their own identities. But lots of my friends tend to be more like me in that way where they definitely want to spend more time with their partners than their friends, but still value their friendships. So, you know, like everyone is different. I think it's all valid. But yeah, I'm always shocked when people want to spend more time with their friends than their partners because I'm like, well, you don't love your partner. There's no way. There's no way you're having the same deep connection I'm having because I love I love my friends, but I I love them. But there's like no fucking way, right? Like, no, you know, Mm-mm. learn to at least it's a journey. Jesus, it's a journey. And as she wanted that, ooh, okay. This definition of love 
for me is also the most healing definition because as I said before, when you're, I could see that. you're around someone that is safe, that you feel safe to be yourself with, the best and worst parts, that's where you can actually start healing a lot of the things that we talk about. I'm sorry, can I just say this out loud, Green Bean? Have you ever had a BPD fave person? Can I tell you the truth of it? Tell me if this is correct. Not to deviate, but since Khadija's borderline, this can be, okay. It's all on subject. This is so dumb. Can you have an anime character be your favorite BPD person? Listen to me when I say this. I always identified as somebody who never had crushes growing up, but I would get obsessed about a person specifically about fictional characters. And I had this meditative like realization the other day where I was like, were my anime characters my favorite people? Now I had them with people too sometimes, I think. But I would call them more like obsessive crushes that made no sense. But I mostly had them with fictional characters. And I'm like, am I doing that? Is that what I'm doing? Is that what I'm doing? And I think it might be. Oh, Miss Fishy says, yes, girl Tumblr girlies do it all the time. Who is it? What do you mean who is it? But like, I think I was doing that. I think I was having like obsessive connectivity with people. You know what I mean? A uh, vegan says, isn't your husband your favorite person? Wouldn't that count? No, no, no. BPD favorite person is not the same thing as healthy favorite person. BPD healthy person is like our favorite person is like an obsession um, and a lot of projection and a lot of like fantasy. But like a um, uh, healthy favorite person is different. Um, yeah. 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 Um, OK, wait. Green Bean says kind of BPD favorite person is just an obsession that you look towards the emotional regular um, and meet your needs, emotion, like, um, I, I'm trying to think of who I did this to in real life. If I did, I have really like my abandonment issues are so good. I pre like, I, I, I know I pre abandon and I have a lot of walls up. I'm like hyper independent. Right. So my issue growing up was that I never allowed people to get close to me. Um, do you mean limbrance? Limbrance is different, but can be overlapped and I think associated with BPD favorite person, but I do think limbrance is different, right? Um, I don't think you can have a healthy relationship with favorite person BPD. From my understanding of BPD, having a favorite person is actually the red flag that you have borderline, right? Like that's different, you know? So like having a favorite person is like an inappropriate emotional a fake fantasy emotional connection with somebody that you've like projected a version of them that isn't real into your like perceived connection with them right so like if you're having a these are all different things right when you're having a favorite person it's like literally one of the signs you have borderline when you have a person that's like oh my god I love my sister she's my favorite person that's just saying I have a bestie that's different when you have limerence with somebody you're having a twisted out like a twisted connection on like what you think is love but is actually like an obsession which is different um like all these things are very different but they're all words that I think they could be confused for one another but I think they're very different my brain separates them very differently right so when I think about borderline and having a favorite person and that's separate from a crush I think let me think of a person that it was like I mean, I've had crushes when I was young, for sure, like boys, and I would write their names in books and girls, and I would think about them. You know what I mean? Like, oh. But it's different. Um, yeah, Ingrid says, I think it's just my tism. I think autistic obsession into things that you like and people are also different. And I think crushing on an anime character is different. Or I think like, again, I think all these things are very, it's about the why. Oh, I don't know why I'm making this so exhaustive. It's about the why. Why is it happening? I actually think that I I can't think of a person who is my favorite person who's real, but I think I might have done it with anime characters growing up where like you feel really connected in a way that's like almost unhealthy. I can't think of a real person I've had this with though and I'm really trying to dig deep. Who would it have been? Because it's definitely different than just like having a toxic relationship that you think can work. Right? Like, oh, I have a toxic relationship and I think it could work and I'm going back and forth. I think that's different. Um, 
Yeah, guys, I'm literally like if I get I'm very like closed off. I shut down very quickly. Like when I was in my borderline days, like hardcore, I shut down very quickly and I knock everyone out of my life. I don't think I ever allowed myself to have a favorite person in a typical way because I think it, it also feels like tearing down my walls for those people. So I, I, I don't know. I have a really hard time with this. I don't know if I've experienced it really. I know I know it when I see it in people, but I can't think of a time Brittany had it, but I will meditate and I will get back to you. Because I am curious, like maybe I forgot about, did I for, how embarrassing, did I forget about it? Did I have it and I forgot? Like, who would it have been other than the anime characters? You know what I mean? Hmm, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. About the generational trauma, the childhood trauma, this complex PTSD, the PTSD, all the personality disorders, the mental health issues, all of those things. Not saying that just being around people that love you is gonna heal problems. Take your meds. <laughs> but there's a, a roomy quote. The wound is where the light enters. The wound and the pain is where you can learn the most about yourself and how to be better or different or however you wanna describe that. A lot of us don't have safe places to nurse our wounds. And a lot of people True. are not safe to do that around. And so, with this definition of love will hopefully allow for a space, the space that we create is allowed for you to heal, for you to come as you are and slowly begin to heal. And then as a result, you feel again, safer and like you can be more vulnerable and that builds trust over time. I'm gonna be doing a video also about the left and spiritual healing and, and spirituality and politics because I really feel like the left needs some sort of spiritual practice or love ethic because girl, Let's go, Khadija. Yes, ma'am. What's going on? The last thing with this definition, for me, it is finally specific enough. It's not so specific that it has to be exactly my way, but it's specific enough that I can go with this and explain it to y'all and also act upon it and refer back to it. And all of the things that I want from love will happen as a result. If I had to describe real love's personality traits as I like to do with large concepts. Real love by the definition that I explained earlier and my own personal belief is compassionate, it is honest, it's accountable, it's non-judgmental, it's committed, trusting, consistent, patient, and vulnerable. Mm. For my definition and understanding, love should not make you feel nuts, it shouldn't be a feeling you can't control and it's all the wacky why. It should bring you peace mm. and should allow you to feel safe and should be a place that you can heal. And I know a lot of us feel confused about love or joke around that it's the lovelessness era. And maybe it is and maybe it's been for a long time. And maybe us observing that is already a first step in changing things up. Yeah, I don't know. I really do mm. believe in love. And I believe in our ability to love each other. I think... We all just got to agree on what love means first and then go from there. I don't I don't even know if we have to agree on it, but I do fundamentally agree that like I love everyone. I love everything because you exist in this great universe and the universe is like alive. And I think that's beautiful and that's love. Um, I don't think we need to agree more than we all love each other. But the thing is, is like not everyone feels that way. Not everyone does think that they can love each other. And I think that's where the shared consciousness comes in. When you think about what is enlightenment or what is that relationship with the macro and micro, it's about love. It's a relationship of love, radical acceptance of the self and radical acceptance of our place in the universe. And it sounds really woo-woo because it really does take you out of your ego. And I think anything outside of your ego is outside of your perception, is outside of the reality. So it feels like metaphysics and metaphysics sounds woo-woo because it's silly, because it's unexplained. But I think science does explain it if we really pay attention to the details. And I think like, when we're talking about love, we're really talking about a deep understanding of self and others and our limitations with those other people. And you know what I'm saying? Oh my God, thank you, SBC Allen. Hello, Allen. $20 super chat. I love you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your efforts, you said, and humanizing people who challenge you. Uh, just, <laughs> dumb, uh, Simon Gang, stand up. Let's go. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. Um, I'm trying. We're trying. We're all trying. But I do, I do vibe with the idea that like we're having like a shared relationship with like existence and everybody has pain. I will say I told my husband yesterday, I swear the universe 
brought you into my life. I told my husband yesterday, I said, I think the universe brought you into my life to teach me patience, not because he's so frustrating, but because I love him so much. I find myself being so patient. I love him so much. I find myself being so much more patient than I've ever been in my life. And it's not that he is a person who makes me, who makes, you know what I'm saying? It's not because he is so, oh, I have to be patient. It's that I just find myself wanting to be. Does that kind of make sense? Like him in my life makes me practice patience because I really, for all the people in the universe, I want to be patient for it's him. You know, I'm not always the patient for my mother. I'm not always patient for my siblings. I'm definitely not patient for my friends. And I'm like, nope, I don't want to be patient for you today. But because of who his place in my life, because I love him more than I love the universe, I want to be the most patient person I can. And patience is always something I've had to work on. I will have to work on it for the rest of my life. I'm not a patient person with most people. Um, But for somebody that I love more than the universe, like who else am I supposed to be patient for except for him? So like I will practice that because I will tell you this little brain likes to and I'm like, no, like, you know, seven with the membership for 12 months. Let's go. Patience is a virtue. Very true. And Stephanie membership for a month. Let's go. Love ya. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Okay, let's finish out this video. We're almost done. There. So let me know what y'all's definitions of love now are after having watched this video or ruminate on it and come back a little while later and let me know if you have your own definition or description. Definitely check out All About Love by Bell Hooks if that's something that you're thinking about. Support a local bookstore if you can. Come on, y'all. Support your local bookstore. As always, don't oh. forget to feed your plants, water your plants. Lydia plants and remember you could always change your mind because you can and i'll see you in the next one say bye lydia see bye cute video okay so i definitely think like their definition of love is very interesting i think there's some work to be had around the language for myself but i can definitely like translate it in a way that i think we vibe ultimately i think khadijah and i would agree um that love is about recognizing like you are me and I am you and that we're all just living people on this shared planet. And ultimately we didn't choose our bodies or our life or anything, but we can choose how to react to that life and we can choose to take more control in our lives by activating that compassion and that love for one another. But girl, I do not have patience for all people. I do not have patience for all people. Let me tell you. In my head, in my life, my belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth. Life was a fool. Da, 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 da.